All right, I guess I'll get started. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I'm Nate Bechtold. I'm an enterprise architect at EBSCO Information Services. And I wanted to give this talk because we are, uh, we've deployed OpenStack. We are in live with OpenStack. We've been that way for a little while now. And we're, we have an interesting story because we're kind of your average large enterprise, but we're not really at the scale of a lot of the, the hyperscale companies you see presenting at summits. Uh, so I wanted to go over kind of the practical issues that we encountered of an enterprise our size um, getting to live with OpenStack and how we wound up solving them. So EBSCO, uh, we are a um, discovery service provider. We provide kind of online research content to mostly libraries, academic um, academic organizations. Uh, if you've gone to if you've gone to college or university, there's a good chance you've used our product. Um, we also serve electronic journals, ebooks. Um, from the back-end perspective, we serve up about 300 million back-end searches per day. Uh, so we do, we do serve a fairly reasonable amount of content. Uh, so what did we need? So around two, two and a half years ago, we started looking at uh, infrastructure automation solutions, kind of the typical story. Uh, there was interest in public cloud, interest in self-service provisioning environments, the development teams, and full-stack automation. Uh, so we kicked off the typical investigation effort, um, and at this point in time, what we wanted to do is really just focus on um, increasing the productivity of our teams and focusing on automation. Uh, we wanted to lower our costs by going with open source solutions. Um, and one thing we were really looking for was finding a solution that integrates really well with other products and allows tools to integrate with it with really good quality integrations. So what I mean by that is we have, there are a lot of solutions out there where their idea of an integration is a plug into a user interface. And when you're talking about automation, um, you're looking at APIs, and those, those types of integrations are almost useless. So we were trying to find a good solution uh, to kind of abstract our underlying infrastructure. And we wound up settling on OpenStack. Um, so why did we settle on OpenStack? Um, at that point in time, we were looking very strongly, we still are, to public clouds, uh, and OpenStack gave us a very easy to consume API that uh, kind of had a very nice methodological alignment with AWS. You know, you don't have API, really good API compatibility, but from a methodological standpoint, you know, the objects line up. You have, an, you have an instance, aligns to an EC2 instance, EBS aligns to a volume, and the same kind of actions are capable in both environments. So you're, you're solving a lot of the same problem set in both of them. Um, a key component for us was abstracting our underlying infrastructure, uh, because if you, try to, if you try to automate, say, a traditional virtualization provider, what you wind up with kind of are a lot of leaky abstractions. You get a lot of changes in the hardware configurations or, say, data store or storage configurations that really bubble up to consumers and whenever you wind up changing them, it affects your automation. So we wanted a stable platform that could really abstract the underlying implementation from our people building automation, from our development and operations teams. Um, we wanted a standard interface to be able to get compute network and storage. Um, and one key that was good for us was that when something integrates with OpenStack, it integrates a lot more consistently than a lot of other solutions. So if you look again back to kind of the traditional virtualization side, you'll find things with VMware support or other hypervisors. But whether you can actually leverage that solution in your data center is another question. Um, how your VMs get IP addresses, you do use an IPAM solution, DHCP, all that can vary from environment to environment. So if you're looking for an end-to-end an -end solution, you don't, you don't often get as much out of the box as you do with a solution like OpenStack. Um, and also, we wanted to build an infrastructure as a service platform that was fit for our live services uh, and that we could hand out to, say, a diverse set of teams and be kind of confident in the level of project level isolation that uh, they wouldn't be able to interfere with each other. Um, it's a big tenant for us to be able to say to our consumers, if you break it, it's our fault, or it's uh, somebody else's fault. It's not your fault. Don't be afraid to use the product. Um, I much rather tell them that than hand them a product and give them a long, pay, a large page of 
best practices and things they should never, ever, ever do. Um, otherwise, some admin is going to hunt them down and say, you shouldn't be doing that. Uh, nobody likes that. No one wants to use a product like that. Uh, so what's our current scale? Uh, and these numbers are a little bit, uh, still a little bit old, but right now we have uh, three separate OpenStack clouds, one backing our development resources and two backing our live environments. We have approximately, oh, well, at that point in time, 1,259 running instances. That was a snapshot point in time. Obviously, it goes up and down all the time. Uh, one interesting metric is since we started OpenStack, uh, we've had almost 500,000 instances created and destroyed uh, since we made it generally available. We find that a very interesting metric to track. Um, about 68% of the workloads are concentrated on development environments because that's where we have a lot of development environments, a lot of development teams, and uh, they have had access to the environment the longest, and they spin up a lot of infrastructure to support their development efforts. Around one-third of our virtualized workloads are currently on OpenStack. So our design philosophy, we really wanted to build a platform uh, to run our production applications. And so what we mean by a platform is we're really providing this platform service and part of it, a significant part of it is OpenStack, but really the platform encompasses all of the tools and integrations you need to bring an application uh, from development and host it in a live environment. So that brings in a whole bunch of other tool sets as well. Uh, we wanted to um, have a solution that was multi-tenant at its core, so we could be able to kind of safely give a development team and an operations team um, a different project on the same physical infrastructure and not be concerned about them uh, creating security issues or affecting each other in any way. Um, all the tools and everything that was part of our platform had to be highly available and it needed to be production grade. So um, good enough for development, uh, but, for not for, for, but not for production, is not an acceptable for a permanent state in our, in our case. And there's a lot of reasoning behind that philosophy because uh, developers and people building automation, they don't want to code to a state that they can't use in live. You get your value in live. So if you start making solutions that kind of work in dev, and then you transition to this other completely different solution in live, uh, that's not a good strategy. So we basically said everything we put into this platform, everything we put into OpenStack, every project, has to be something we at least have a path to live with. Uh, we didn't want to put any toys in it. Uh, we wanted to make sure all of, our, all of our offerings were really built for general purpose and customized as little as possible. Um, kind of provide a menu of infrastructure offerings. So once you get OpenStack out there, suddenly you always wind up getting uh, people saying, oh, well, I want this specific configuration of core and memory, and you don't have any of your flavor model. Can you please build me that flavor? And what you wind up, if you go down that path, is you get a lot of different flavors, and you get flavors with application names in them and all sorts of crazy things you don't want to be able to support. So we drew a hard line and said, everything we put in here uh, should be general purpose. If you found a flavor that you know we don't support and we find a good general purpose for it, yes, we'll gladly add it. But we won't add one with your application name in it. Uh, same thing for all of our storage offerings and everything we've done through OpenStack. Um, the other part is we wanted a, a solution um, with good safeguards that would encourage experimentation. Uh, development against any kind, of, uh, any kind of platform is a lot easier when your developers can actually experiment on it. They don't need to worry about bringing down the entire environment. Uh, it makes them go a lot faster because they don't need to fully research everything they're going to do. They can experiment and try things and find out what works, and that gets you a much faster feedback loop. Um, so what does our current architecture look like? I'll go into, I'm going to go into this a little bit more detail later. But right now we have uh, OpenStack. Uh, for our monitoring solution on top of OpenStack, we'll end up leveraging Zabrix. Uh, for kind of an operations uh, dashboard, we use Rundeck. Uh, we use that to kind of power a lot of the um, automated jobs we built to operationalize OpenStack. Um, for some of our dashboards or metrics, we use Grafana. Uh, and then we use all the core components yeah, that you see on the, the presentation there uh, from OpenStack, and also we use a product called Avi, a software-defined load balancer for all of our load balancing within OpenStack. And here's some of the things that we learned. So we learned we had quite a few problems to solve, uh, and they kind of fell into a bunch of broad categories of skills and training, uh, selecting vendors and integrations, 
uh, the actual deployment of OpenStack, adoption, and productionizing it to get it to live. So first part, and you'll probably hear this all throughout the summit, all, all throughout the summit, OpenStack skills are very hard to hire. Uh, they are very hard to hire. Um, and if you don't get the direct OpenStack experience, uh, direct OpenStack hire, you need somebody with very good Linux administration experience, and that seems to make sense. But what usually winds up happening in a lot of organizations, kind of like ours initially, is uh, your virtualization team is what winds up taking over um, the OpenStack POC, and you get a lot of skill sets for VMware, uh, but not necessarily Linux administration. So that can be a gap that has to be plugged. Um, and and in, inexperienced administrators on top of OpenStack can do large amounts of damage. Um, when you're running as admin, the safeguards are off, safeties are off, you can do terrible things. Uh, so you need to understand the system very well to be an admin. Um, how, do we, how did we kind of get around these? We decided we're going to develop uh, through our POC uh, basically a set of core group of subject matter experts who are going to be very hands-on and become experts and kind of uh, train the rest of the team. Um, we decided very early on, we, um, we actually attempted to go this way originally, but our advice is uh, don't waste learning opportunities by over-reliance on professional services. If you want to use professional services, it's a good idea to use them as, say, architectural guidance, but it's not a good idea, at least in my opinion, to have them come in and actually install OpenStack for you. Uh, you miss a very big learning opportunity for your team, and ultimately they just kind of get handed this thing over the fence that they really don't understand how, how to operate or how it was installed to begin with. So you lose a very big learning opportunity by um, not letting them do the installation the first time. It means it's going to be a little bit harder, but everything you learn is going to be directly transferable to their job as administering it. When you look for new candidates, look for people with strong Linux backgrounds networking, virtualization, Python skills. Don't look for a direct OpenStack experience. If you get it, great. Um, but we've, fa we've had uh, much better success looking for people with a strong foundation and then training them on OpenStack. Um, give, your, give your team the opportunity to experiment and learn how OpenStack works. Uh, people learn by doing. And if you don't have a safe sandbox environment for them to experiment on, uh, then they're going to have to experiment on real environments and potentially cause issues. Um, and vendor support, so if you go with a vendor, you get support, then uh, that's going to lower the amount of expertise you need to get to production. You always have that, that bat phone to call if some issue arises and you don't know how to deal with it. So it means you can get to production sooner and with less people. At least that was the approach that we took. Uh, vendors and integrations. So there are a lot of OpenStack, uh, a lot of vendors who integrate with OpenStack today. Tons of vendors and varying degrees of quality as to how good those integrations are. Um, and there are lots of established vendors. And ultimately, uh, with whatever vendor you pick, with a direct or indirect integration with OpenStack, um, you need to be approaching it with the philosophy that uh, everything under our platform is going to give our development or our operation teams the tools they need to deploy and manage a highly available application. So our preference, we strongly prefer uh, products that integrate with OpenStack's multi-tenancy model. It makes it really easy to get integrations. So, and a lot of them will align with the OpenStack project model. So their existing OpenStack login will get them access to all of these other services that they need. That's a really clean and nice model. Uh, focus on vendors who are building uh, for cloud natively rather than trying to integrate it and tack it onto a product that wasn't built for it. Um, look at areas everywhere to improve your stack. Reevaluate all your product decisions. Uh, there's high value when a product integration is done correctly under OpenStack. Uh, it, w it can work really well and increase your adoption. Uh, and also, you're never going to know how good an existing vendor's integration is until you actually try it. Uh, there's a lot of hidden landmines uh, with missing, missing support or API capabilities, things like um, we've encountered Cinder drivers that didn't support snapshotting functionality. And from, your, uh, from a developer's perspective, if you were relying on snapshots, it's a breaking API change. So you're not going to really know um, how good the integration is until you actually get it up and kick the tires. Uh, so a good case study. Um, we, when we first approached, we said, all right, let's, let's integrate with our existing load balancing system. 
um, the existing vendor. They had um, kind of a limited OpenStack knowledge, they had a bare bones implementation, but we tried to integrate it under LBAS. Um, we encountered issues, we encountered a lot of issues. Um, we actually encountered a bug in their product that wound up uh, kernel panicking uh, it many times. And when we went to go approach support, uh, we got this interesting answer back. Uh, for now, to, to, to avoid failover, I would recommend to program the OpenStack not to delete IPs. Uh, so what that told us, OpenStack wasn't really a first class citizen for this vendor. They really didn't even know what it was uh, from their support perspective or the fact that the code that was running there was their LBAS driver. Um, in our case, LBAS v1 at that point in time, it was very limited. Uh, we didn't think it would cover very many production use cases at all. Um, and fundamentally, our load balancing product, if we weren't using LBAS, it really didn't support safe multi-tenancy. It was really hard to kind of give somebody access and say, hey, you can't break it. You can only break your own things. And no, there were all these shared resources where if they weren't knowledgeable enough, they could cause an outage. It was a prolonged evaluation period, um, ultimately uh, resulting in rejection after about six to eight months, and we went back to the drawing board. So this is when we brought in uh, Avi, and this was a really nifty product because it was built for a cloud from the get-go. So our, the installation pro process was basically deploy the controllers, point them at your OpenStack, and it provisions and manages all the load balancers underneath automatically. Um, so that allowed us to move really fast. We were able to get basically a production grade load balancing solution in our development environments, send out a general availability announcement to, our to all of our teams saying, hey, you've got access to load balancers. All of you have had access to OpenStack. You've got access to load balancing now within a week of actually purchasing the product. Um, so we were moving really fast. Uh, its multi-tenancy model aligns with the Open, OpenStack's project model. So there's a, pro, there's a tenant inside of the Abbey product. It aligns with the tenant inside of the OpenStack product. So when we give somebody an OpenStack project, they've got the ability to um, do everything they need from infrastructure and load balancing perspective automatically. Uh, there's no giving them a separate login or giving them access or permissions to different systems. It's just baked in. Um, and that was really powerful. Uh, the other part was uh, because we went with this product, um, it has a very strong kind of insight and analytics module to it that the development teams really enjoyed. Uh, and this helped us, um, made people want to move to the new platform, want to move to OpenStack, and want to move under Avi uh, because it was naturally incentivizing. They really liked the, um, the functionality they were getting. So that was a good example where we kind of dethroned the existing vendor in place for one that approached uh, clouds as a first class citizen. All right, problems to solve on the deployment side. Um, deployments on OpenStack are, take a long time and they tend to be very complex. The story is getting a lot better than it used to be, but for the first time approaching it, it is still a very complex problem. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of functionality in OpenStack isn't ready for production and it's not always obvious what is and what is not, uh, especially to a newcomer. So from our experience, when you're gonna do your deployment, one of the biggest things to do is align all of your resources, all of your, your manpower for storage, networking, data center teams, make sure that supporting this installation is a top priority in troubleshooting issues, uh, top priority for everyone in that, uh, in that um, tier or anyone who's allocated to this project, uh, because OpenStack requires really this tight integration with all of your infrastructure components, and you get a very slow troubleshooting, um, and a very slow troubleshooting feedback loop, basically, when you um, start encountering issues with, say, networking or storage, access, uh, an account doesn't work. If you have to go back and submit a ticket, that is going to make your deployment generally take a very, very long time, and people are gonna lose context while they're sitting here waiting for the storage team or the network team to respond to that ticket. So it's going to directly affect the time it takes for you to deploy, and it's gonna take directly affect the quality of the product uh, at the end of the day, because uh, people get their, um, it, it's hard to keep your mind in the right place when you get those constant interruptions. Uh, you need to understand what deployment um, choices are difficult to change afterwards and make sure you get them right. There are certain ones like core networking drivers, some storage decisions, 
where, uh, whether you want an SDN platform or not, that you really get one chance to do it right at deployment, and if you want to undo that decision, you have to redeploy a whole OpenStack cloud. And there are some that, uh, that are easy to change afterwards. So it's important to identify which ones are gonna be very hard to change, um, and make sure you've done your due diligence on them before going forward. Um, and assume it's gonna take you multiple tries to get a production-ready configuration, you're probably not gonna get it on your first go. On the adoption side, adoption is one of the most critical elements to really success in a, any private cloud. Uh, so what I'd strongly recommend is have a really close relationship with your early adopters. Um, they're gonna help you. Uh, you're gonna help them by giving them access to something that they want, and they're gonna help you increase the resiliency of your deployment. Go up there, speak to them regularly in person. Uh, help them understand OpenStack, help them learn it, and be open to them when they tell you about problems. So when you go through, you, that'll help you understand when they say, oh, I tried to provision some instances yesterday and they failed. Now your team can go in, find out, troubleshoot, why did they fail? Was it because maybe somebody restarted Nova Compute at a certain time, or maybe you have an issue in, uh, in your messaging tier? Uh, that feedback early on and that close relationship will help you build a much more resilient product at the end of the day because they're going to tell, basically do the opposite of what a lot of people do, to have them tell you every little hiccup this system has early on. That, that will help you a lot. Uh, get the deployments into users' hands as fast as, fast as humanly possible. There's only so much you can do in a POC environment uh, once it starts taking real, real workloads and you have real people on it. Uh, that's when you start seeing uh, how well it's working and what you need to fix. Uh, well, and this one was very important for us, don't stall getting into production. Teams do not want to code to an API that they cannot use in production. So yes, we got a lot of early adopters, and then we had a lot of people sitting here waiting and saying, yep, this is really interesting to us, but until you can give me a path to production with this, you know, I'm not going to commit any development time. Um, and that is going to limit your adoption. So just merely having the environment in your production environments available um, will increase your adoption rate considerably. From our perspective, it was almost exponential growth from the second we put it into live. Uh, I think our environment started doubling approximately every six months from that point on, a literal exponential growth. Um, and early feedback is really critical to this process. So productionization. Um, OpenStack provides a lot of uh, building blocks, but some assembly is required to actually build a product out of it that's ready for production. Um, monitoring and common operational tasks are really not solved out of the box. So OpenStack kind of gives you all the little Lego bricks to piece together, but somebody or something on your side has to actually piece them together to get, make them work. Um, so one of the biggest things that we found that was successful is monitoring OpenStack by actually using OpenStack. Provision instances, provision volumes, attach them to instances, exercise the functionality, um, because OpenStack's a complex system. Trying to approach it from the bottom up and actually figure out what the impact of an error is really hard. When you have that top-down monitoring, when you say, all right, an instance is failing to provision, you know what the impact to the customer is, you know what the impact to your users are, and now you have something that you can troubleshoot a lot easier. Uh, so that's where we had our most successful monitoring uh, was from that tier. That was what would always pick up issues and help us troubleshoot. Um, OpenStack is really complex. Finding the effect of a failure is a difficult problem. Um, it's important in order to get adoption that you find these issues before your users do. Uh, if your users start finding these problems and you don't know about them until they report them to you, they're gonna lose faith in the resiliency of the product. Um, another important bit, co automate, completely automate common operational tasks. In our case, things like taking a compute node or a control node out of service, um, restarting OpenStack services, uh, some elements of patching, any, um, any common operational task, automate it. Uh, in our case, we used Rundeck to, um, to be the, uh, the kind of the single pane of glass that people can go to to, to run these tasks. Uh, but that will lower the barrier to entry for people actually administering OpenStack and give you a, it kind of helps plug the gaps and kind of assemble those Lego blocks into a cohesive story. Uh, this one might be a little bit controversial, but I would say OpenStack HA is complex and it is needed for all environments. We went out 
on our development environment originally we did not do an HA installation and what we found is a lot of um, tasks and troubleshooting that involved restarting OpenStack services or uh, testing out configuration, it was almost always disruptive. It was almost impossible to make a non-disruptive change when your environment isn't highly available. Um, also, you want to make sure you have an adequate twist testing environment for any changes you make because uh, an HA environment is a lot more complex than a non-HA environment and they act very differently. So from our perspective, we said everything has to be HA uh, from the ground up and that includes development and every resource. Our development environment we treat exactly like a production environment. Uh, so what did we actually do? What did our, our process look like beginning to end? So we started out in Havana. Um, we did a prototype. The usual dev stack, single, all-in-one machine, learn the basics, validate direction, keep it a disposable environment uh, because it will probably go down, you will probably trash it. Uh, so make sure anyone using it understands that. In our case, we did blow it up many times. And then we transitioned to what we called our interim environment, which was we broke apart compute control uh, and started getting experience in a distributed environment, got feedback uh, from our users and determined the desired configuration. And that's when we went with a highly available environment on Juno at that point in time. And um, we treated it exactly like production. Uh, we announced it was generally available for all of the development workloads and started to determine the tasks we needed to do to, to actually take this thing into production. And then finally we went to production after we figured out the problems we needed to solve. Um, but what wound up actually happening is we had this big delay that I went, talked about early in the presentation between dev and production. Um, it was, there was a lot of reasons for it. Um, one issue was a critical team member met, left and we spent too long looking for somebody with an OpenStack skill set um, to backfill that position uh, that we lost a lot of time. Um, so we wound up going with somebody with a strong uh, Linux administration experience um, because that just set us back way too long looking for somebody with OpenStack talent. Um, we figured out that additional work had to be done for monitoring and operations before we were confident having this host uh, production workloads. Um, and a lot of the required skill sets to do that actually weren't part of the OpenStack team at that point in time. Um, so our solution was create a focus squad. Um, and what we did is we kicked off a, basically a six week effort with a cross-functional team, everyone we needed to get the job done. Uh, they fo the requirement was anyone on the team would have to focus 100% on this project. Didn't matter what else was going on. Uh, director had a good quote where he, he said, uh, set your email to out of office if you have to do that. Um, but it had to be top priority for all of the members. Uh, and the focused effort was incredibly efficient. We, um, the feedback loops for troubleshooting were incredibly reduced. Uh, there were very few blocked tasks, and when they were blocked, they weren't blocked for very long. Gave us a higher quality implementation at the end of the day. And I think within, um, what was it? It took us um, several weeks to a month to get the first. Uh, from first installed to get the first dev QA out there and we had both of our live environments done I think in a couple of weeks over here and that was with the, uh, with the enhanced productization and more documentation tasks. So it was, uh, that focus was incredibly important. Uh, the focus squad, what they did was we created a reliable monitoring solution based on Zabbix and we wrote a Python framework to execute checks on OpenStack. Uh, that's the part that does the uh, does the instance provisioning, uh, reports on health. Um, it, one thing we had to do is say, if an instance provisioning fail, fails, it's generally important to identify what part of the workflow failed. So um, if you have a lot of these compound actions, for example, if you want to test volumes, if you want to test sender, you, we have to provision an instance, provision a volume, attach it. Uh, but if Nova is having issues and you can't provision that instance, we don't want to reflect that as a cinder failure. So we had to put in a lot of effort into making sure we um, returned the correct component of uh, the failure in these, com in these kind of compound monitoring tasks. Uh, we created automated recovery uh, for issues we discovered in the dev QA environment. Um, things like automating compute node evalu uh, evacuation on a, fail on a failure. It's essentially one API call to evacuate a compute node when it fails, but um, something has to make that determination and something has to make that API call. It's not going to be OpenStack. 
So um, we had to put that into Zabbix. Um, and we automated some of our uh, failed OpenStack service recovery uh, workflows. So every now and then an agent or a service in OpenStack would either lose communication with a message queue or get into a bad state and need to be restarted. We automated those restarts and kind of made OpenStack a self-healing environment. Um, we also increased visibility into the environment and tried to make it as publicly, public as possible with Zabbix and Grafina. <coughs> automated common operational tasks with Rundeck. Um, and uh, we deployed all of this infrastructure. So we deployed, these weren't pre-existing systems. We deployed Zabbix, Rundeck, OpenStack, and did all of this within the six week time frame. <coughs> so tracking success. Um, this one is really difficult because it's critical to getting ongoing commitment, uh, but it's really hard to track how successful was your OpenStack deployment. Was OpenStack the right solution for the company? Um, and that's really hard to get kind of a, a metrics-based analysis behind. So what we wound up doing was we counted some KPIs, like how many, instance are, how many instances are on it, how much resources are allocated to the environment, uh, the number of teams that are leveraging OpenStack. One interesting thing we found was uh, the number of instances that were created and deleted was a very useful metric because it wound up being an indicator as to whether teams were actually using the environment correctly. Were they provisioning elastic resources? Were they provisioning kind of ephemeral systems? Or do we have a, lo a lot of long-standing VMs and they were just kind of using it for self-service provisioning? Um, and I think that's pretty much it. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Oh, oh. oh I'm sorry, I can't, I can't hear. Can how, oh, how big is our team? Our team, um, our team is uh, between three, three and four people. I'd say three people are uh, really proficient on the OpenStack side. For storage, um, we use uh, NetApp for storage. Um, uh, we found the NetApp integration was actually pretty high quality. It worked, it worked very well out of the box. Uh, so we have a lot of NetApp and we just stuck with it. So that's our Cinder provider. Um, we also did go the route where we do use um, kind of a, a shared instances mount and we do support live migration. Uh, so that's backed by NetApp as well. Um, that was one of those things where we didn't really want to do it, but we did it to get faster adoption. But we put forward, uh, we said, live migration is kind of a best effort live migration rather than a guaranteed, a guaranteed solution. So we do it to minimize the impact of the environment, but it's not guaranteed. All right, thank you very much.